I'm standing to the south of the fort of Brocolicia, otherwise known as Carabra on Hadrian's Wall. And over on my right hand side, you can see the corner of this fort, the southwest corner of it. Now, we know the fort was probably in, uh, put in around about sort of the 130s AD by a cohort of Tungrians, and the Tungrians were from modern day Belgium. Um, and we know that later on it was also occupied by a cohort of Batavians from the sort of Dutch Rhineland area. And we know they were here because they uh, put altars up in a nearby temple. And that is where we're going to go to next. Behind me is a Mithraic temple here and it was discovered in 1949, there'd been a drought that year and the ground had shrunk revealing the tops of the three altars. So they realised there was something here and then dug down to reveal the, 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 the rest of the temple that they could see here. Well Mithraism is a very ancient religion and quite a secretive one at that. It was highly popular amongst Roman soldiers here. No uh, women were actually allowed in these temples at all. Now, a Mithraic temple, unlike many Roman temples, was designed to look like a cave and was often underground for that reason. So let's go and have a closer look at this temple. On either side of the temple, there would be a stone benches on which the cult members would recline during their meetings. And that you can see at the very end, there are two statues, one of which is that the, only the feet remains. Now, these are statues to Cortes and Corto Partes. But only Cortes on the right hand side survives, but minus his head. In front, there is a, a vestibule, often called a, a narthex, which was separated from the main body of the temple by a timber screen. And it seems that it was in this area where various initiation rites were conducted, completion of which allowed the worshippers to move to the next grade. Now these trials uh, were a sort of series of physical, spiritual trials by fire, by water, heat, cold, fasting and something called journeying. So highly popular among um, Roman soldiers who were invited to join a Mithraic cult and they had to sort of go through these various trials in order to rise through the various levels. We have three altars here each of which was dedicated by a prefect of the first cohort of Batavians. If you recall, Batavians are from the sort of Dutch Rhine Delta area, in fact. And the one over here on my right um, has got three holes pierced into it. And there was a recess at the back. And it's, it seems that there would have been a lamp or, or, or a candle or something like that put at the back of here, allowing the light to shine through these holes and thus illuminating the whole, the whole impact of this particular altar here. Um, behind me though is also a shelf which um, would, have, would have held something called the Tauroctony. At the back of all Mithraic temples was something called a tauroctony. Now this usually takes the form of a carved relief and depicts a variety of figures, animals and scenes, all of which appear in any tauroctony anywhere within the Roman world. Centre stage is the god Mitra or Mithras, the god of the cosmos. And he's always shown grasping a bull's head and plunging a knife into its, into its shoulder. And other creatures can be identified here. There is a dog and a snake, both, both leaping up to sort of lick the bull's blood. There's a raven and a scorpion. And in the top left-hand corner can be seen the sun god pulling a chariot bearing the sun. And in the opposite corner is the moon goddess. You may also spot the two characters called Cortes and Cortopartes, who also appear in this temple and they hold torches. One has the torch held up, the other has the torch held down, and this may signify life and death. So what does it all mean? Various theories have been put forward to explain the, uh, the tauroctony, the elements of a tauroctony, but one of the most compelling is that it possibly represents a fusion of astrology and astronomy. During Roman times, it was believed that the earth was fixed at the center of the universe, and around it moved the stars and the sun. And the sun was actually moving in front of the various constellations, creating the zodiac with which we're all familiar. But there was also another celestial equator on a different plane with its own constellations. 
And these were, in order, Taurus, the bull, Canis Minor, the dog, Hydra, the snake, Corvus, the raven, and Scorpio, the scorpion, all of which appear on a tauroctony. Now these two spheres, the zodiac sphere and the celestial equator, intersect with each other at the equinoxes. That's uh, the spring and the autumn equinox. And however, those two points of intersection are not fixed and move slowly over time from one kind of constellation to the next, moving backwards through the zodiac, a process that takes nearly 2,600 years. So, if you can remember this, more than 4,000 years ago, the spring equinox was in the constellation of Taurus. Around 2,000 years ago, it had moved into Aries, represented by the ram. Today, the spring equinox is in the constellation of Pisces, and in a few hundred years, it will appear in the constellation of Aquarius, the so-called dawning of the age of Aquarius. Therefore, does the Tauroctony symbolize the end of the age of Taurus by the all-powerful god of the universe, Mithras, who is also often seen to be holding a cosmic sphere in one hand while his other hand rotates the circle of the zodiac. This Mithraeum was abandoned and demolished by the early 4th century. Its statues were broken and the Tauroctony removed altogether. And this may have been possibly done by Christians. Over time, the Mithraeum became submerged beneath the peat and vanished from view until 1949. Well, behind me is Coventine as well. This is just a few metres um, upstream from the Mithraic temple that we've just been to. Now, Coventine as well was obviously a shrine dedicated to the water goddess, Coventina, and it probably uh, has been of significance even pre-Roman times because when it was excavated in 1875, it was found to contain a huge number of votive objects, including more than 13,000 coins, just coins. And many of the other objects um, have been um, put on display at the Clayton Museum, which is part of Chester's Roman fort. At some point, the, the well was deliberately blocked to conceal it from Christianizing influences. And that blocking resulted in this very shallow valley becoming flooded and the development of peat, which then in turn helped towards the preservation of the Mithraic temple. Coventine as well was excavated by a chap called John Clayton. Now John Clayton is very key to the whole history of Hadrian's War. He was the son of a wealthy banker who had bought Chester's house which lies in front of Chester's Roman fort. Now on inheriting his father's house, John set about excavating the fort. He then began to buy plots of land containing sections of Hadrian's War to prevent further robbing and quarrying, which was rampant during Victorian times. So by doing so, he's actually regarded as the man who saved the wall. And at Chester's Fort, there is a small museum called the Clayton Museum, which is full of the various objects and artefacts and votive um, offerings that were actually found in Coventine as well. Right, we're here at uh, Limestone Corner now and you can see over here is the North Ditch and it's running up behind me and you can see there's some massive blocks of rock as well and it's here that the Romans encountered a problem. At this point here the windsill, the dolerite is extremely hard so the Romans had a real tough time in trying to sort of dig it out of the ditch. Here. And when we're going to go up a little bit further, we'll see where they actually abandoned the attempt and, and, the, and the ditch remains unfinished. By contrast though, the vallum, which is over on my left hand side, was dug through the, this dolerite uh, a few years later. <clears throat> I'm here standing in the north ditch and looking around, I'm surrounded by huge blocks of stone. You can see here, this is a cut edge of the ditch here, and they've taken out huge blocks of stone and literally just thrown them onto the, the embankment here on the, on the south side. Well, this 
block of stone represents a moment in time when the Romans gave up. They were defeated by the hardness of this rock. You can see in this stone here, we've got wedges. There's, there are many of them here. It is where the Romans are driving in sort of a, a metal tipped wedge along thin quartz work veins. Here's one running through here in order to try and split this rock apart. But they failed, they gave up. And an order must have come from above to say, Stop work, down tools, we're not going to do this any longer. And if you just look then behind me, you'll see that the ditch literally just fizzles out to the east. I'm standing inside um, Blackcart's turret, which is uh, turret 29A on Hadrian's Wall. And it has been severely robbed. However, the back wall stands about 11 courses high here. And we have the entrance right here. And you can see that there are this, this, the, the grooves for the door jams on either side and a channel here where the door would have been brought in um, to hang on its pivot at that point there. I'm standing near the end of the Roman bridge abutments at Chester's and just across the river is, uh, is Chester's bathhouse. Now there were two bridges at this point here. The first bridge was, was built simply to carry the wall across the river and it consists of sort of nine arches and a walkway across the top. Then when the military road was built they had to widen that bridge in order to carry the, the road across it too. So the old bridge was taken down and a new bridge of just four arches was inserted in place, in place of it. Okay I'm standing here on the bridge and I've got evidence here for the first bridge that um, carried Hadrian's Wall over the river and it's, and it's right here. This is the footings of one of the earlier pillars. Remember there were eight or nine arches over the river at this point and this is the, the pier for one of those arches. And then this would have been taken down and four larger arches are put in afterwards. Behind me there is this wall here, which is the, uh, a tower at the end of the bridge, and there would have been one on the other side. And the other feature to note are the sort of splayed walls here and here. And these are put in to sort of reinforce the bridge end here, to deflect flood water, and also to prevent backscouring by the river as well. So here we have another fine phallus. If you remember, we met these actually built into the wall just to the east of Bird Oswald. And another one is here for exactly the same reason. It's, it's to ward off danger, ward off the evil eye. And that's why we have it at the lowest course of, of the bridge abutment here. So once again, just as at um, Williford Bridge, we've got the same features. We've got this sort of dovetail clamping here and we've also got uh, Lewis holes here and here. So Lewis holes would have been used to contain a Lewis key which would, have, which would have brought that piece of stone into position there. And the clamps here are to actually pull the stones together. So they'd be cut by the mason and then a piece of sort of slightly warm iron would have been hammered into that place and then lead would be poured in to seal the joint. Well, here we have a column, and they think that these columns are actually up on the parapet of the bridge, and you can see this sort of um, protruding boss. The whole thing looks a bit like a torpedo, really. This would have been um, possibly holding a statue, so this would be an upright with a statue on top. On the bank over there are various stones, many of which have been dredged out of the river of the previous decades, including another one of the columns. I'm sitting in the remains of a massive water channel which goes behind me and through the turret and comes in from the far side there. And what we can see here are, is one of the coping stones over this channel. Many of them had, are, are collapsed as you can see behind me. We don't really know what this channel was for, but it's obviously bringing water through. So it's possible there may have been an, an as yet undiscovered mill some, somewhere in this vicinity.
Well, this is uh, St Giles's Church at Chollerton, and you can see it is primarily a Victorian rebuild. But we're going to go inside where we're going to see something uh, much older than that. Well, here we have one, two, three, four, five pillars, Roman pillars, which have probably come from the fort at Chester's. And here they are holding up the south aisle of the nave at St Giles's Church. So what we have here is a font, a font that's been created out of a Roman altar, so it's been reused and it's actually been inverted so the top is at the bottom now and the base is here and the base has been hollowed out and a hole put through for the water to drain out of there. I want to pause here just a moment to recap and consolidate what we've learned so far. The Roman legions started leaving Britain around 383 AD and were completely gone by 410 AD. The Roman Empire had come under attack from Germanic and Jewish tribes across the empire and back in Italy, there was also uh, a lot of un internal unrest. This meant the Roman legions were needed back home to defend Rome itself. Of course, not every single Roman left. Um, many Roman citizens remained in Britain after the army had left, as many of them had become intermarried into the local population. But it is safe to say that the moment the armies had left Britain's shores, the local communities started taking the stone from the wall to build other things. And why not? It provided a vast resource of quality-faced stone, completely free. All they had to do was carry it away. This is the main reason there are vast areas where nothing of the wall remains and then in other areas it remains almost intact. The areas where the local population is the densest is where the wall has been robbed the most. As we saw at the beginning, very little has survived around Bowness and where the city of Carlisle lies today until you get further east to Walltown then, where the landscape is more rural and rugged, a great deal of the wall survives, mostly because there was less reason to steal it, being fewer people needing fewer dwellings, um, but also as the terrain made it harder to carry the stone away. Then, further east, you get to Hexham, and the abbey here was built entirely from the stone on Hadrian's Wall, mostly robbed from the fort at Corbridge. As Anna Gray, my colleague, has already explained, people like John Clayton were directly responsible um, for saving sections of the wall. And of course, today, the protection is the responsibility of English heritage. Where I am today is a village called Hedden on the Wall. The name Hedden comes from the Anglo-Saxon words heath, meaning heather, and dun, meaning hill. 
therefore the hill where heather grew. This section of surviving wall is 255 metres long and 3 metres wide, which is the original width before Hadrian ordered it to be narrowed. To the north of the wall was the North Ditch, as we know, and this particular section was filled with stakes and forked branches, if you like, a sort of Roman barbed wire. As you can see, once the legions had left, much of this stone was taken and buildings in the village were constructed using that stone. This circular construction in the wall is not Roman, but thought to be medieval, created when the wall was dismantled and is simply a kiln for drying corn. Town Farm, at the west end of this section of the wall, sits on top of Mile Castle 12, but no trace of it is visible above ground today. From this location here at Hedden on the Wall, uh, we're going to be heading east towards Newcastle city centre itself, and we're about two or three miles out of the city here. From this point, the wall actually disappears underneath the main road. And most locals know this as the West Road, but it's also known as the Military Road. And that is because it was built in 1746 by General Wade um, to move troops quickly between Newcastle and Dumfries after the Second Jacobite Rebellion. Wade used Hadrian's Wall as a foundation for his road. Evidence of this we will see shortly, um, uncovered by Northumbrian Water when they were doing some work in the city. And of course this is not to be confused with the military road that Anna Gray talked about, um, which was constructed some 1,600 years before and is completely different to this one. The next location the wall becomes obvious is here in West Denton, right on the side of the A69, which is the main road between Newcastle and Carlisle. Not much left, just a couple of courses of stone with the infill material. However, just a hundred metres or so across the busy junction with the A1, um, we have a 65 metre stretch of wall incorporating Denton Hall turret which was turret 7B. Of course, its construction was a similar layout to the others we've already seen, although this one is built with unusually large stones. It's thought this turret had three storeys accessed inside by a wooden ladder, which ascended from this platform here, and a flat roof on top acting as a lookout platform. At the end of this section of wall at Denton Turret, we're looking west at the moment, you can see this bungalow is sitting right on top of the wall and the chap who lives here has actually carved the head of Hadrian to commemorate the fact that his bungalow is sitting right on top of Hadrian's wall. Fantastic. The wall continues pretty much along the route followed by the A186 into the city centre, also known as the West Road. Another few hundred metres reveals another outcrop of wall at Denton Burn, situated at the roadside again near a busy junction, hardly noticed by the local people. 
And this tiny section that remains is literally on the edge of a garage forecourt. A little further along the A186, we come to another major junction on the approach to the city centre, the junction with uh, Tubal Lonnan. In August of 2021, Northumbrian Water were digging to install a new water main and discovered the early foundations of the wall running right down the middle of the road here. A little further along the A186, east into the city, and we reach Benwell. This was the location of a Roman fort, one of 13 built along the wall. This one was occupied by a cavalry regiment from northern Spain, and it was known as Condacum. As already explained, after the wall was built, a huge earthwork vallum was constructed to create a separated military zone. Here at Benwell, we see a causeway built across the vallum so that roads leading from the south could cross into the fort. This one lines up directly where the south gateway of the fort would have been. Halfway across the causeway would have been an arched gateway with large wooden doors. Today, a housing estate built in the 1930s covers the area. A few hundred metres away lies the remains of a Roman Mithraic temple, similar to the one we saw at Broccolicia. Today, it survives slap bang in the middle of another housing estate. It was discovered in 1862 during an excavation by the then landowner George Whitewick Rendell when this area was a park. The temple was built in 178 AD just outside the walls of the fort as you can see from this diagram. It was dedicated to a Roman god Anteno Sitticus it appears that this was the only temple anywhere in Roman Britain to recognise this god. Most Roman temples were dedicated to gods that would protect or give strength in battle, etc. But there is no clear understanding of who this particular god was. Some think it may have been a Celtic god who symbolised some rare quality that the Romans decided to adopt when they arrived here. Whoever the god was, it was important enough for the Romans to build and dedicate a temple to. A statue once stood in the temple and the head of that statue still remains. It can be seen in the Great North Museum in Newcastle. Foundations of the wall have been found in the city centre recently during excavation work. On the original plans for the root of the wall, drawn up by Hadrian himself, the intention was to start the wall in Newcastle, where a bridge crossed the River Tyne called Pons Aelius, which was guarded by a fort of the same name. The remains of that fort lie beneath the medieval castle, constructed around 1172. However, the plans were changed very early into the construction to extend the wall to the fort at Sedgedunham, four miles to the east. Leaving this area without the wall would have left a vulnerable gap in the frontier. It is thought this oversight may have been realised during Hadrian's visit in 122 AD, though no conclusive evidence exists to verify this. This area around the medieval castle keep is quite an exciting location, right in the heart of the city, because here within metres of each other, you have three distinct eras of construction. Going back in time, we have the most recent structure, which is the Victorian railway arches, built in the mid-1800s. 
These arches intrude right into the centre of the site that was once the medieval castle built in 1172 by Robert Curtos, the eldest son of William the Conqueror, and giving the city its name, New Castle. The Black Gate, as it is known, was added a hundred years later by Henry III. These medieval structures are both built on top of the oldest and original building here, the Fort of Pons Aelius, which in Roman means Bridge of Hadrian. The next significant showing of the wall doesn't appear until Wall's End, aptly named as the eastern end of the wall as we know it today, and where the numbering of the mile castles and turrets begin. Just before we reach Sedgerdunham, we reach the area where Mile Castle 1 is situated, buried under Union Street here in Wall's End. And finally we reach the eastern end of Hadrian's Wall here at Sedgerdunham. There is an 80 metre section of wall visible, with a reconstruction of what the wall would have looked like next to it. This short outcrop of wall runs at 90 degrees and right angle to the wall and basically sealed off the area between the south wall of the fort and the river. So that concludes the journey from west to east. I do hope you've enjoyed it and it's proved to be informative and enjoyable at the same time. Uh, my grateful thanks go to Anna Gray of Discover Lakeland Tours for her input, support and countless hours of research um, in the making of this film. 2022 is going to be a very, very big and eventful year here on Hadrian's Wall. So if you've never visited this part of the country before, um, it is well, well worth a visit and there would be no better time to come than this year. If you have been here before, then again, there is going to be lots and lots of events um, that are uh, obviously new and uh, exciting to witness. Whenever you plan your visit I hope it will be enjoyable and memorable. I'm sure it will. As always please subscribe to this channel, give it a like and switch on the notifications so you can stay up to date with all my latest releases. I look forward to being with you again very soon, but for now it's goodbye.